Hey there, and welcome to another deep dive. Today, um, we're diving into a topic that might be on your mind or maybe someone you know, lumbar spinal stenosis, specifically that tough decision, yeah. surgery or not. It's a crossroads so many people face, and we're diving into a patient decision aid to help kind of navigate that. Think of this as your cheat sheet for that crucial conversation yeah. with your doctor. We've got the facts, the personal consideration. Exactly. It's about empowering you to make informed decisions about your health. So first things first, let's break down what lumbar spinal stenosis actually is. That sounds a bit intimidating, right? It does, but it's a pretty straightforward concept. Imagine your spinal canal in your lower back as a tunnel, and those nerves branching out from your spinal cord are cars trying to pass through. Now with stenosis, that tunnel starts to narrow. Ah, so it's like rush hour in your spine. No wonder it causes problems. Exactly. Yeah. That narrowing, often caused by arthritis, creates a traffic jam of nerves. That's what leads to the pain, numbness, weakness in your back buttocks and legs. Okay, so arthritis is the usual suspect here. But you mentioned that treatments focus on managing symptoms. Right, not curing the arthritis itself. What does that mean for someone dealing with spinal stenosis long term? It means that while we can address the symptoms and improve your quality of life, the underlying arthritis might continue to progress. So even with successful treatment, there's a chance symptoms could return down the road. That makes sense. So let's say someone is diagnosed with this condition. What are their options before jumping straight to surgery? The good news is there's a whole toolkit of non-surgical approaches you can try first. Give us a rundown. What's in this toolkit? Well, first off, think about simple tweaks to your everyday activities. The guide calls it uh, changing the way you do your activities, but that might sound a bit vague. Yeah, it does. Got any real world examples? Absolutely. Think about tasks you typically do standing up. Maybe you're cooking, washing dishes, or folding laundry. Try using a tall stool instead. It takes pressure off your lower back and helps maintain a more comfortable spinal position. Or picture yourself at the grocery store. Instead of just walking around, use a shopping cart to lean on slightly. It provides support and can make a world of difference. So it's all about being mindful of your posture and finding ways to take the load off your spine. Smart. What else do we have? Pain relievers are a classic for a reason. Over-the-counter NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen mm. can help manage inflammation and pain, giving you some much-needed relief. Makes sense. And of course, there's exercise and physical therapy, right? I've heard those can be game changers. You've heard right. Targeted exercises can strengthen your back muscles and improve flexibility, which is key for managing stenosis. A physical therapist can guide you through the best routine for your specific needs. So it's not just about popping pills. It's about actively working to improve your strength and mobility. Now, I've also heard about steroid injections for back pain. How do those fit into the picture? Steroid injections can be incredibly effective for short-term relief. Imagine them like a targeted dose of anti-inflammatory medicine delivered right to the source of your pain. They reduce swelling around the nerve root, which can significantly ease your symptoms. So they're like hitting the pause button on your pain, yeah. but the guide mentions that they're not a permanent fix. Right. Why is that? That's because the steroid medication eventually wears off. It's like hitting the pause button. Yeah. But eventually that button pops back up. It can buy you some time and relief, but it doesn't address the underlying cause of the narrowing. So it's a temporary reprieve, not a long-term solution. Makes sense. But what happens when those non-surgical options just aren't cutting it anymore? Well, that's when the conversation about surgery might come up. The most common surgical procedure for lumbar spinal stenosis is called a decompressive laminectomy. Okay, decompressive laminectomy. Let's unpack that. What exactly does it involve? Remember that tunnel analogy we talked about earlier? With a laminectomy, the surgeon acts like a road crew, widening that tunnel by removing some of the bone and tissue that's squeezing the nerves. So they're basically creating more space for those nerves to breathe. Exactly, and sometimes they might combine this procedure with something called spinal fusion. Fusion, it... Uh... That sounds intense. Why would they do that? It's all about stability. Imagine your spine is like a bridge with multiple pillars holding it up. If those pillars are weak or unstable, the bridge could collapse. Spinal fusion is like reinforcing those pillars by fusing two or more vertebrae together so they become one solid unit. So it's an added layer of support, mm -hmm. especially if someone has other back problems alongside stenosis. Interesting. But how effective is this surgery? Does it actually work? The data is encouraging. A lot of people experience significant relief from their symptoms, often for eight years or more, but it's important to remember that everyone's different and there's no guarantee of complete or permanent pain relief. 
right? Managing expectations is key. And of course, no surgeries without risks, right? That's true. We're talking about the possibility of infection, nerve damage, blood clots. Those are the usual suspects with any surgery. But there's also the potential for chronic pain after surgery, which is something people need to be aware of. That's a serious consideration. And I remember reading that there's a chance the surgery might not work or that the symptoms could come back later on. Why does that happen? Sometimes the stenosis can recur in a different area of the spine. It's like playing whack-a-mole with your back pain. And in some cases, tissue can grow back and start compressing the nerves again. So it's not always a one and done solution. That's important to know. Okay, we've covered the surgical side of things, but what about the risks of not having surgery? What happens if you decide to stick with non-surgical treatments? For most people, trying those non-surgical options first is perfectly safe and often a good starting point. <laughs> However, there's always the risk that those options won't be enough to control the pain and limitations caused by the stenosis. Meaning the pain could stick around and impact your daily life. Exactly. You might have to keep modifying your activities, avoid certain movements, or rely on pain medication long-term. And that can take a toll on your overall quality of life. I see. And the guide also mentioned some red flag symptoms that warrant immediate medical attention. Can you remind us what those are? Of course. If you start experiencing loss of bladder or bowel control, sudden changes in your walking ability, or any rapid worsening of neurological symptoms, you need to get to a doctor right away. These are signs that things are escalating, and waiting it out is not a good strategy. So those are serious warning signs that shouldn't be ignored. Got it. So with all that said, when would a doctor typically recommend surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis? Surgery usually enters the conversation when your pain is severe and significantly impacts your daily life especially if those non-surgical treatments haven't provided sufficient relief after a reasonable amount of time. And I imagine those red flag symptoms we talked about would also push things in that direction. Absolutely, they signal a potential need for more aggressive intervention. Okay, so it's a complex decision with a lot of factors to weigh, and the guide we're discussing doesn't just lay out the facts right, it takes it a step further and helps you figure out what matters most to you. That's what's fascinating here. It's not just about the medical side of things. It's about understanding your personal values and priorities. And that's what we'll dive into next. Stay tuned, because we're about to get into the nitty gritty of making this important decision. All right, so we've laid out the options, the non-surgical toolkit. Right, and the surgical route. But now comes the hard part, making the decision that's right for you. And that's where this guide really shines. It encourages you to think about what you're willing to risk and what you're hoping to gain. It's like holding up a mirror to your own values and priorities. Right. It asks those thought-provoking questions like, how much does your back pain actually affect your life? Yeah. And how important is it to you to avoid surgery? Those questions can help you clarify what matters most. For some people, even a small chance of improvement might outweigh the risks of surgery. They're thinking, hey, if there's even a slight possibility this could make my life better, I'm willing to take that chance. But for others, the potential downsides, like a long recovery period or the chance of complications, might feel like too big of a hurdle. It's all about finding what feels right for you. It's about weighing those potential benefits Yeah. against those potential risks. Right. And speaking of risks, the guide does a great job of breaking those down for both sides of the equation. On the surgery side, there's the standard stuff, infection, mm -hmm. complications, but also the more specific risks like nerve damage and the possibility of needing another surgery down the line. And it's crucial to remember that even if the surgery is technically successful, there's no guarantee your pain will completely vanish or that you'll bounce back to your pre-stenosis activity levels. So managing those expectations is key. Now flipping the coin, what about the risks of not having surgery? What happens if you choose to stick with the non-surgical route? The most obvious risk is that you might continue to experience pain and limitations that interfere with your daily life. Think about it. Maybe you're struggling to work, enjoy your hobbies, or even do simple things like walking or standing without discomfort. That's a big deal. It really is. Chronic pain can wear you down, yeah. not just physically. Exactly. But mentally and emotionally, too. It can impact your mood, your sleep, your relationships. It's a ripple effect. And remember those red flag symptoms we talked about? If those pop up, 
delaying surgery could actually make things worse down the road. So it's this constant balancing act, yeah. weighing those risks and benefits on both sides. This guide isn't about making the decision for you, right. but about giving you the information and the framework to make a more informed and personalized choice. It empowers you to have that crucial conversation with your doctor where you can discuss your individual concerns and preferences. It's about finding that sweet spot hey. where medical recommendations and personal values align. And ultimately it comes down to oh. what you're most comfortable with. Exactly. There's no right or wrong answer here. What's fascinating is that people approach this decision from different angles. Some folks are naturally risk averse. They'd rather exhaust all non-surgical options before even considering surgery. And that's perfectly valid. But then there are those who are dealing with such debilitating pain that surgery feels like their best shot at getting their life back. They're willing to take a calculated risk because the potential reward relief from that pain is so significant. And there's no judgment in either approach. The key is to have that open and honest dialogue with your doctor. Ask all the questions swirling in your head and make a choice that feels aligned with your goals. So where does this all leave us? We've talked about what lumbar spinal stenosis is, explored the non-surgical and surgical options, and dove into the potential risks and benefits of each path. We've laid the groundwork. Now it's time to zoom out, look at the bigger picture, and see how all these pieces fit together. I like that. Let's synthesize what we've learned and help our listener connect the dots. All right, let's bring it all home. We've covered a lot of ground. But what does it all mean for you, our listener, who might be wrestling with this decision? If we connect all the dots, it boils down to this. Lumbar spinal stenosis is a common condition, especially as we age. But the good news is you have options. And those options aren't one size fits all. It's about finding the path that aligns best with your individual needs and goals. Exactly. Let's start with the non-surgical route. We talked about making simple changes to your daily activities, those little tweets that can make a big difference, like using a stool for tasks you'd normally do standing, or leaning on a shopping cart for support. It's about working smarter, not harder, right? Right. And then there are pain relievers, those yeah. trusty NSAI that can help manage inflammation and take the edge off the pain. And we can't forget about the power of exercise and physical therapy. Right. Building strength and flexibility in your back is crucial for managing stenosis and improving your overall mobility. It's like giving your spine the support it needs to stand up to those narrowed spaces. But we've also got to acknowledge that sometimes those non-surgical approaches aren't enough. That's where surgery comes into play. We talked about laminectomy, that procedure that creates more space for your nerves by removing some of the bone and tissue causing the squeeze. Sometimes it's combined with spinal fusion to add stability, especially if you have other back issues going on. Surgery can be a game changer for many people, providing long-term relief and improving their quality of life. But it's a big decision and it's essential to go into it with realistic expectations. Absolutely. There's no guarantee of complete pain relief, and there are always risks involved with any surgical procedure. We talked about infection, nerve damage, blood mm -hmm. clots, and even the chance that the pain could return down the line. So let's talk about how to weigh those risks and benefits. The non-surgical route, while generally safe, might not provide enough relief for everyone. You might face ongoing pain and limitations, impacting your daily life, and potentially even leading to emotional distress. And if those red flags appear, loss of bladder or bowel control, changes in walking ability, or a rapid worsening of symptoms, that's a clear sign you need to seek immediate medical attention, regardless of whether you're leaning towards surgery or not. Those are serious signs that shouldn't be ignored. So how do you decide which path is right for you? This is where it gets really personal. The guide encourages you to think deeply about your priorities, values, and what you're willing to risk how much is this pain impacting your daily life? What are your concerns about surgery? What are you hoping to achieve with or without it? It's about finding that sweet spot where medical advice and personal preference meet. Maybe you're determined to try every non-surgical option before considering surgery. Or maybe the potential for relief outweighs the risks in your mind. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong answer here. What's important is having all the information talking openly with your doctor and feeling empowered to make the choice yeah. that resonates with your individual needs and goals. We hope this deep dive has given you the knowledge and the courage to navigate this complex decision. Remember, you're not alone on this journey. Lumbar spinal stenosis is a common condition and there are resources and support available to help you find the best path forward. Keep asking questions, stay curious, and remember that your health and well-being are worth advocating for 